so for everyone watching, uh, this is Coindesk Year Zero from those who were there panel celebrating Ethereum's fifth birthday. Um, and I'm, I'm hosting this panel. Uh, my name is Camila Russo. I'm the founder of um, DeFi Focus content platform, The Defiant, and also the author of The Infinite Machine, the first book on the history of Ethereum, um, sitting there behind me. And we have um, Anthony Diario, the, one of the co-founders of Ethereum. So really excited to chat with him. Um, we, we haven't talked for a while since our interviews for, for the book. So really excited to see what you're up to. Um, so Anthony was, like I mentioned, one of the initial eight co-founders of Ethereum. He organized the famous Miami trip, which was one of the only times uh, most of the Ethereum founders were, were together and where Vitalik announced the project for the first time. He helped bootstrap Ethereum in the very early days um, from the Toronto, Toronto hub at uh, Decentral. So um, really great to, to be chatting again. And uh, to start, um, maybe you can retell the, um, the story of, you know, that fateful um, Bitcoin meetup in Toronto where, you know, you first met Vitalik and that, um, you know, was probably what kind of kickstarted your involvement in Ethereum, right? Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, it was about a year before the, before, actually more than a year before Care Ethereum was uh, I guess first brought to some of the, the initial people, but uh, I had decided to set up a, a meetup in Toronto for, for Bitcoin because nothing had existed. And I had been digging into Bitcoin for a number of months prior and just absorbing everything that I could when I found out about the summer of 2012. And when I looked for a community, I found it was about time to start you know, interacting with other people in Toronto. When I looked for any type of community, there was nothing out there. So I went up on meetup.com and I started a uh, a meetup for, for Bitcoin and put a call out to other fellow Toronto residents that were interested in, in learning about Bitcoin. And I, uh, I, I had a place at, at a bar that I was able to take a back area. And uh, I think it was roughly 10 people. I don't remember the exact amount. Mm. Roughly 10, I think it was, that showed up. And uh, Vitalik was one of those people where I first met him. And Peter Todd was another and a couple others uh, notables in the, in the, in the community. And uh, that was really the spark of our first our first meeting, and um, I think Vitalik really really stood out to me as a very very quiet, humble, um, you know, person. Very very super shy at the time, mm -hmm. and over the next few months, I was hosting him on a, on a monthly basis and got to know him more. And the meetups grew from you know eight ten people up to hundreds afterwards, and and uh, then I later on uh, started doing them weekly even. So that was really the genesis of the Toronto Bitcoin scene was mm -hmm. bringing people together. And I kind of became a center of gravity for the community, uh, hosting the events and, and getting to know people and ideas started flourishing and people coming together with, with fantastic ideas. And um, that then translated to, um, um, you know, over the next few months, Vitalik had been traveling around the world and I myself as well had been traveling around the world. I'd set up the, the Bitcoin Alliance of Canada a national mm -hmm. nonprofit organization. After doing Toronto, I wanted to, to connect with with those around Canada, so I started a, a nonprofit, more of, a, of a, a national organization. And I was traveling around the world as the executive director of that organization, uh, doing speaking engagements, and and then expanding my global network of uh, of, of uh, in the crypto space. And I would meet up with Vitalik every once in a while at different conferences, and and he was writing at the time for Bitcoin Magazine, and he was doing some specific articles on what I was doing in Canada on Bitcoin Magazine and just, just got to know him and saw his progression over that year. And uh, one interesting thing was going to the Amsterdam conference that um, Mo Levin had put on. This was one of the, the initial ones in 2013 and, and seeing Vitalik go up on stage and just being so impressed with his, his, his uh, transition towards uh, and his confidence towards being a speaker and someone that could start really relaying ideas. So it was really interesting over that year to see him flourish in terms of uh, coming out of his shell a bit and being able to present in front of people. And I think uh, that year was probably one that he really grew and, and um, started really showing um, his, his smarts, his writing skills with Bitcoin Magazine. And uh, so yeah, that kind of started right from the, the Bitcoin meetup uh, in, early 2000, in, in the end of 2012. Um, and I guess that kind of relationship with Vitalik then led to him um, 
showing you the his Ethereum white paper. Like how how was that when when, when you first uh, got it? And then you know taking this um, growing Bitcoin community in Toronto. How how did an Ethereum community start start to form after after Vitalik sent that white paper? Sure. So in 2013. Uh, me and my, my partner at the time, a business partner, we started building Bitcoin wallets. The company was called CryptoKit. And Vitalik actually helped us out quite a bit with CryptoKit. And he was providing some, some uh, advice and guidance and even helping us through some issues that we had. Uh, well, there's one time when Google Chrome had removed CryptoKit from their store. Mm. And it really caused a lot of chaos because a lot of our users were basically their wallets were gone and uh, they ended up removing us because there were a lot of copycats of our product and they accidentally removed our product along with all these copycats oh. and Vitalik jumped in. I remember I was traveling one time and it was the middle of the night and I got this call that the hotel that, uh, okay, everybody's wallets are gone. Chrome's removed the app. And I remember oh Vitalik, Vitalik jumped in and basically was able to figure out how users could still access their wallet, even though the Chrome extension wasn't there. And mm -hmm. when Google put it back up, uh, everything was fine. And it was really interesting because that was the, that was the time that Apple had been removing a lot of the crypto products. Mm -hmm. And we thought Android, uh, that, that Google was doing the same thing, but it, it turns mm -hmm. out that they actually uh, put an announcement afterwards that they apologized that they removed the app. They didn't mean to, and that they were actually pro Bitcoin, or they they, they weren't going to be following what Android was, what, what Apple was doing. So it was it was really interesting. It was the first announcement that that Google was actually okay with what was going on in the crypto oh, wow. space, unlike with, with what Apple was doing. Mm -hmm. So because of what Vitalik was was doing with CryptoKit, and you know he's from Toronto, we were meeting for meetups, mm -hmm. we we're meeting internationally. We really built up that relationship there. And then when I set up the physical hub of, of Decentral around the same time that uh, he was working on the white paper. Um, he showed it to me. I showed it to Charles Hoskinson, uh, who had also been, I'd been connected with recently. Mm -hmm. uh, he was working on the Bitcoin education project at the time, and I was working with Bitcoin Alliance of Canada. So we were both involved with educational stuff and trying to bring together communities. So uh, what, when Vitalik showed me the paper, I thought Charles would be a great person on the technical side to take a look at it and see what he thought. Mm -hmm. He was you know, floored with what he saw. I connected Charles with Vitalik um, and that, that's the three of us there. And then Vitalik brought in Mihai from that he was working with Bitcoin Magazine and Amir Chetrit who was on Color Coins. And that was a genesis of the five of us starting uh, the chat groups together on Skype. And, and that's really was, was the first five that emerged uh, as the initial five founders of the project, uh, which then expanded out to, to, the, to the eight after that. Right. And so what, like in those very early Skype conversations, like what sort of things were, were you discussing? Well, it, it, so this was probably, this was uh, the beginning of December, 2013 mm -hmm. uh, till about the end of December, 2013. So it, it was the initial thoughts. Okay. What do we need to do? What do we, what do we need to do to build up communities and let people know about this? Um, so we really started showcasing what we had to a few select people and then it started really just just growing it started just mm -hmm. organically um we, we had we had we had like I don't know, dozens and dozens of skype groups that we had mm. um, and skype was really the main channel that we were using for the first few months um so we had the, the we called it the um it was the the, the, the the there was the founders channel which was called the oh god i have to remember what it was actually called um but it was it was basically we, we were the ones that were taking responsibility we were the ones that the fiduciary, it was a fiduciary group. Mm -hmm. It was those that were saying, okay, you know, Satoshi never came out when he launched Bitcoin with what we're doing though, there's people behind it and we want to be visible. So what, as, as the founders and what really determined us as the founders was the fiduciary responsibility that we were taking and the risks that we were taking to start setting up the organizations, to start hiring the team, to start mm -hmm. setting up the business. I set up uh, the Ethereum Canada uh, organization uh, so that we could start hiring people and we had to pay people and things. So I was the, the sole director of that organization because it was the fastest thing to put together so right. that we could start hiring. Um, we, we brought in a, 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 an HR person to start building up a team. I brought in my lawyer to be the first lawyer on the project. 
And it, it was the risk. And this is what really di differentiates the, the founders from others in the group. Not, not necessarily my people think of, you know, there's a lot of people involved and there were tons of people that contributed and, and brought this project to fruition. I think at one time we had, it was, the total was about 50 or 60 people that we determined were those that contributed in the early stages that were actually rewarded with a portion of the sale because of the effort and work they put on as a part-time uh, worker, a full-time worker, or as someone that was, that was temporary or that was minimal. Right. So it was that fiduciary responsibility that we decided that we were going to take on because there were so many unknowns at the time. Mm. We didn't know how the world would react to this new platform that was being announced uh, as we were trying to set up a, a, a product sale. There was a lot of unknowns and, and we, we said, we'll take that responsibility and that risk. And that really was a determining factor of the founders that if anything wants to happen and anybody might have been at risk, it was those people. Right. So that's kind of the distinction um, of what makes the founders and what didn't. And we eventually expanded out to the eight. It was really that fiduciary responsibility that we took on that if something did happen or something went wrong, we would be the ones that would be responsible. Yeah, makes sense. Um, and so another kind of important uh, discussion that was happening in, in the very early days was this um idea of, of what what ethereum would be going forward this either a, a nonprofit foundation or a company and so i remember you you telling me you felt a little bit blindsided right by the decision to make it a foundation and so i'm curious um now seeing you know what, what ethereum has has done so far do you think it was the the right decision or what what's your view like looking back at, at that um, discussion. I think we'll never know how it might have happened if it went in a different direction. Right. And I think you can only look at that, look at the success of things right now and say, it's really amazing what's come out of this. And it's really hard to say how things may have been different. We always had, we had a debate back in the day and we always referenced as, do we want to be the crypto Mozilla or do we want to be the crypto Google? Not in terms of those companies themselves, but just mm -hmm. in the idea of there's so much that, that, that a few of us believe could be more advanced with proper funding mechanisms and run as an organization. But there was the other side of it as well. And in the space, it's very difficult um, to get alongside uh, people that are, that are in the decentralized movement when you have corporate entities and things involved. And I understand both sides of those things. So I don't know what it could have been. All I can say is that it is what it is. And I think it's been amazing. And it's just, it, it, it's, it's um, I don't think I'm here to say whether it could be better, it could have been worse. I just think, look where we are right now. We're having events around the fifth year anniversary and it's just an amazing thing that's transpired. And it's just, you know, hats off to everybody involved for, for taking it where it is right now. Yeah. And so look, looking forward, um, are you still as, as bullish as in, in the beginning? And like, where do you see it going? So I was, I was bullish in the beginning. When, when Ethereum was, was, you know, when it first started out, the idea of something beyond Bitcoin was really... It wasn't out there. The concept, everything was Bitcoin. Um, my my organization, my company, Bit, was Bitcoin decentral. When Ethereum came about, it was wow. There's something else that could be that could be more powerful out there. And the transition really changed towards what what, what can we do to improve things from where they are. Um, you know, there was a number of years that had gone by before you know between the start of Bitcoin and Ethereum, a lot of advances in technology. So super bullish when Ethereum came out. I dropped the Bitcoin from Bitcoin Decentral, I turned it now Decentral, realizing mm. that there's more than one. And never did I ever disregard Bitcoin or think that, that Bitcoin is not as amazing as it is. I, I, I tend to, to be, try to be very inclusive. I, I think any technologies that advance our space, the decentralized movement further uh, is worth taking a look at. So super big on Bitcoin. And then with Ethereum, super bullish on Bitcoin. And then after Bitcoin for me, it was, you know what, there's gonna be others that come out. And mm -hmm. is Ethereum going to be the be all and end all afterwards? And uh, for me and my mission, would it make sense to continue to try to empower people to be in control of their digital lives by creating wallets and technologies and infrastructure for many other uh, different projects? And that's what I continue to do after leaving Ethereum mm -hmm. uh, in the later 2014. And so I would say that there's even a period of years from then until now where I might not necessarily have been super bullish with, with Ethereum. Mm. 
to me, it's whatever makes a perfect project. You have to have elements of community. You have to have elements of structure. You have to have elements of where the funding comes from. There's so many different elements that make a perfect formula for what a project is. Mm -hmm. And I must admit that I, I thought there were some, some, some things that were deficient in, in Ethereum. Um, I think that after the, the departure of, of a few people in the organization, there was a little bit of, okay, we're, we're, we're now, the project was a little deficient in certain areas. It was very strong on the development side and being able to organize the developers in the project, but on, on the business and structure and what needs to be done when you're in a, um, a, a, a project that has to have entities in different countries, with that comes a lot of responsibility in terms of setting up corporate structures, hiring people, all the different things that are involved. And I do think that the project was deficient for a period of time of that organizational structure. In fact, I came back after even leaving to help settle things with, with the board. And I traveled back and forth to Switzerland to try to help out with some of the issues that arose when the new board came in. And when Ming, Ming the executive director was having some issues, I think it was about three or four times in, in the span of 2015, I traveled back and forth to meet with lawyers. This is after I had left, but I was asked to mm -hmm. come back and help out with some things. And so, I, I was not convinced that the way things uh, in 2015, not on the development side, on the technology side, but more on ensuring that, that the structures, the legalities, and the things that needed to be safe and secured were being done. So I did think that there were some deficiencies in the project, which led me to, you know, I continued my, my plan with, I'll support other projects. And I was, I, I, I was very early on and helped uh, get get things like 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 VeChain and Quantum and a lot of the Chinese projects off the ground, mm -hmm. but I, I I think there's a time for the last few years up until this year where I did feel that there was opportunity for other projects to step in and potentially uh, stake their ground, and this year I've come more back to the thinking that uh, Ethereum, you know, is is set itself in a very good place with the community, with the developer community, especially the amount of businesses and projects being built on it, that it is heads and shoulders above the closest competitors. And I, th I think that I, I do feel much more bullish of where Ethereum is now than where it's been over the last few years. So wow. I must say that, that um, yes, I support many different projects, but I, I do think that, that Ethereum is, has positioned itself for success. And I am, I, am, I am confident in what's going on with the project right now. And I do look forward to a number of years of, of it uh, just, just sailing high. Wow, what, what a, a good way to end the panel. Um, that's a breaking news here. Uh, I think, you know, Anthony Diario, the most bullish since the project started. Um, awesome. Well, great, great, great chatting. I, I wish we had, um, if, if you can quickly catch us up on what you're doing right now before the, the next sure. panel starts. We've got maybe a minute left. Uh, I, my, my company, Decentral, builds Jax Liberty, which is a, a way for people to manage multiple different cryptocurrencies on many different platforms. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's always been my goal to provide infrastructure and create the tools that empower people to be in control of their lives. Uh, we're non-custodial. We never have, have access or take control of customers' keys or have access to them. Uh, we support many projects that, that our users want to use. So we're much more inclusive in, in what it is we do. And uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum are the two top projects which account for 85 to 90 percent of what it is that, that we do with, with uh, Jax Liberty. Awesome. Great, Anthony. Great chatting again. Thank you, Camila. And I've really enjoyed your, the book so far. I'm about three quarters of the way done. And hey. I just have really enjoyed it. And there's not one part of it that I thought personally that is not accurate. And I think you've just done an amazing job of bringing the history to it. So congratulations. Thanks so much. That, that means a lot. Thank, yeah. thank you. So yeah. glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> okay. Bye. Okay. So... Are we live? <laughs> Hi, Cammy. Hey, Adam. How you doing? Hey, Texture. <laughs> We're oh, I put hey, on Ken. a beanie and sunglasses for you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Signature style. Um, awesome. Everyone's on. Um, so oh, this is exciting. So many characters from my book. <laughs>
<laughs> Great. So uh, this is the second uh, part of the um, uh, Ethereum Year Zero panel for CoinDesk. Um, again, I'm Camila Russo, the founder of The Defiant and author of The Infinite Machine. And I'll introduce uh, the, the panelists for, um, for, for this part of, of, uh, of the panel. So uh, Ken Seath is the managing partner of a blockchain Ventures. It's uh, a venture fund investing in early stage blockchain companies. And his very first investment in crypto was in Ethereum's pre-sale, which I narrate in my book. Um, Anthony Donofrio, aka Texture, <laughs> was part of the team overseeing communications of Ethereum in the very early days and has remained a very active member of the Ethereum community. Um, and he first heard about Ethereum from Adam. Um, <laughs> and Adam V. Levine here it led one of the crypto's first and the most followed Bitcoin um, a Bitcoin podcast called Let's Talk Bitcoin. And that evolved into the LTV network with its own LTV coin. And he continued to experiment with um, different tokenization projects at Tokenly. And he is now the editor at uh, Coindesk Podcast. So um, it's a really diverse and interesting group that uh, we have here. Uh, you were all involved in some way or another in the very early days of Ethereum. Um, Ken as an investor, Texture as a community manager, Adam as a journalist and enthusiast. Um, so I'm interested to hear how, how do you remember thinking and understanding Ethereum uh, when you first read the white paper or learned about it? Um, was it like the next Bitcoin or a scam or like a platform for unstoppable applications? Um, how did you make sense of this new project? Um, Adam, maybe we can start with you. Sure, so uh, thanks for having me by the way, Cami. Um, so it wasn't another Bitcoin because everything had been trying to be another Bitcoin to that mm -hmm. point. Uh, and for me, I was looking for solutions and Ethereum offered some really interesting ideas about what was possible with a blockchain mm -hmm. that you couldn't really do with Bitcoin, at least at that point. Um, and then the other thing about it that was uh, very interesting was that it was Vitalik and Vitalik mm -hmm. before he became the founder of Bitcoin was like one of the really earliest journalists in the space before I you know, mm -hmm. was doing journalism in the space. It was Vitalik and he was super young. And I met him a couple of times at a couple of different events um, in the years before he would go on to actually, uh, you know, write the Ethereum white paper and then go on to kind of start that. Um, and he always struck me as somebody who was just so genuine and had kind of such an intelligence about the way that he was looking at many of these things. Like for a lot of people, it was really very ideological, right? Cryptocurrency was sort of this libertarian phenomenon. Um, you know, where people wanted a system that worked more like they thought it should. And Bitcoin can, you know, uh, could do kind of most of those things. I don't really think that that's what Vitalik was there for. I think that he was mm -hmm. there for kind of the possibilities. And I, I found that, frankly, infectious. Um, mm -hmm. I remember kind of ambushing him at the first uh, uh, Bitcoin conference I went to in San Jose in 2013. And like, just like complimenting him a bunch of times about mm -hmm. all of the articles that he had had written that I read. And like, he didn't even, he didn't have the ability to say anything in mm -hmm. kind of response to that. He just kind of like, it was kind of like, it was buffeting him, right? Like he just kind of took it, but didn't really know what to do with it. So it's right. been really kind of amazing to see all of this kind of grow out of the ideas of someone who at least on the outside seemed very timid and kind of very uncomfortable with being in the spotlight. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that was kind of it. It was like, on the one hand, it's like, this is different than Bitcoin mm -hmm. and offers a different value proposition. And that was different because everything was like, oh, Bitcoin was successful and everybody got rich. How do we do the next Bitcoin? Mm -hmm. And this wasn't that. This was how do we do the thing that comes after Bitcoin? And then on right. the other side of it, it was Vitalik. Right. Um, yeah, so something completely different. And I guess that's what caught so many uh, people's imaginations. Um, Ken, how, how, about, how about you? Well, so I, I um, had heard about Gavwood and Vitalik for about a week before I met them. Uh, I was at the uh, Texas Bitcoin conference in, I think, early March of 2014. And before I went, I asked for someone, I asked someone for a rundown of 
what to expect there and who I might want to meet. And they were top of the list. Mm -hmm. And I remember meeting them the first day I was there. And just as Adam said, uh, Vitalik was super shy. Uh, he was seemingly uncomfortable in the spotlight where he spoke um, for, I think, an hour that, that day. Um, but he clearly had fanboys and, mm -hmm. uh, and he clearly was a matinee idol. Mm -hmm. and, um, and usually when you're in a room of really smart people and they look to someone as a matinee idol, something, something substantive is there. Mm -hmm. um, the, the person who I spent much more time with during that three-day conference and a little bit after was Gav Wood. And uh, Gav, um, for those who don't know, was the CTO and co found one of the co-founders of Ethereum along with Vitalik. And Gav had, has, it still has, no time to suffer fools. And I was a fool and I didn't know much about it. And I understood <laughs> Bitcoin and was holding Bitcoin. So I wanted to learn more about it. Um, but Gav and I spent a lot of time there because we had a friend in common. And it was in that conversation that I got my first sense of how, to Adam's point, Ethereum was different than Bitcoin. And it took about a day, maybe two, for me to understand in my own language how the two differed. But the one thing I walked away from the, that three-day conference with understanding was that there is a, there is a, a protocol layer and an application layer. Um, much like there's the internet and, and, and an application layer like Google and Uber that sit on top of it. And as, as I walked away from that conference, what I realized was that Bitcoin was both the protocol layer and an application layer, and that um, Ethereum had taken away the application layer and, and, and bared just simply the protocol layer. So mm -hmm. in my mind, Ethereum was the internet when I walked away and Bitcoin was email. And mm -hmm. it just so happened that when Bitcoin was built, because there was no internet, it also had to build its own protocol layer. And so um, it's a very simplistic view of it, uh, but I'm an investor. And so I frame things in terms that I understand. I held Bitcoin, which at that point I considered a relatively mid-stage investment, call it a series D investment. And Ethereum had a white paper, basically the equivalent of a PowerPoint in my world, no code, it was still working on its yellow paper, I think at the time. And uh, so that was like a pre-seed investment. And it struck me as someone who was in the business of making money that if they get it right, that uh, this, is, this is a very different business as you, as you aptly put it, Adam, um, but it is earlier stage and potentially bigger because the protocol layer could be bigger than the application layer. Right. And so from day one, when I made that investment, I didn't fully understand it, but I did understand that if it was successful, it was very different than Bitcoin because it had enabled Bitcoins. Um, mm. It enabled companies to be built on top of it. And, and that felt really, really uh, a, a massive, massive potential market. Um, for me, it was a bet on Vitalik and Gav. It was mm -hmm. a big market with two matinee idols at a conference filled with really smart people and I didn't need to do much more diligence. Right. And it, I mean, high risk, high return, right? It, it really did pay off. <laughs> um, yeah. Texture, how, how about you? Um, uh, you know, I, I, I love kind of the, the, the colorful story you, you told for, for the book on like how you learned about Bitcoin and, and Ethereum. So yeah maybe, yeah, maybe you can tell it here. So I was not interested in Bitcoin at all. I thought it was some sort of really lame internet money for nerds distributed <laughs> by lottery. Like mm -hmm. uh, my, my roommate told me about it when it was a dollar and I told him, uh, am I allowed to talk like myself or do I need to like censor <laughs> myself? I, um, I think just talk, right? <laughs> um, I told him to fuck off. I was like, I don't care, you know, I'm, I'm interested in I'm interested in world changing things. I'm not interested in whatever the stupid thing is. Mm -hmm. um, it wasn't until that it hit 1200 for the first time that I said, well, it doesn't matter what I think because clearly other people think whatever. So, mm -hmm. um, you know, he convinced me to listen to Adam's podcast. When I was listening to it, I saw 
the, the potential for blockchain as a transformative kind of fundamental shift in the way that we structure value and um, how how things uh, can emerge within the, within the structure of human society. And uh, I just saw it very clearly. And so, you know, I was, I think, one of the very few people who didn't read the white paper and then go, holy shit, this is the future. I saw the future and I went and harassed Adam during his anniversary. So I drove <laughs> It was my 28th hours, birthday. <laughs> and I drove 28 hours. Is that what it was? And I drove 28 hours on, on his 28th birthday. And I made him sit in the hot tub with me for six hours. And we just sat there having our minds blown. Like, it's weird today because you hear about Ethereum and people just, you go, you know, this is Ethereum. And then they go, okay, cool. But when Adam and I had the conversation, like literally our heads hurt, you know, we were sitting there with our hands on our heads and like, it gave us headaches and we, it just felt like we were giving birth to some new thing that had never existed before. And it was such a weird novel experience. And for the first three to six months, when you would tell somebody about Ethereum, you knew they got it. Cause they were like, I don't, I don't, uh, oh shit. And they would start rocking back and forth and they'd grab their head and they'd be like, my head hurts. Everything's going to change forever. <laughs> so my, when I read the white paper, I just thought, eh, this isn't quite it, but it seems close enough and it must be kismet. I'm here. This is what, this is where this path has taken me. And then we jumped in the Skype room. It was me, Adam, Vitalik, Charles. I don't even remember who else was there, but we were like the first eight or nine people in the Skype channel. And, and that was basically the, you know, where Ethereum started. Mm. Adam, do you remember that, those um, like Skype conversations? That, what were you guys talking about? Like, how did it feel like to be there at like the very early, early days? So, uh, <laughs> so what I remember about the Skype conversations is that I had a real problem with the pre-mine that mm. they were uh, putting in place. And I actually wound up getting kicked out of the uh, Skype channels. Oh, no. um, uh, at I think the end of January or maybe early February mm -hmm. uh, as a result of that. But yeah, I think I introduced the project to Charles Hoskinson, who was an early co-founder, to Jonathan Mohan, to Texture, to uh, kind of a bunch of the early players. Um, and uh, those conversations, you know, again, like in hindsight, like <laughs> I don't know if anybody has records of them, but they would be fascinating because so many of the ideas that would go on to be important, many of which still really haven't been developed or we still really haven't seen manifest in real life, were discussed at that, at that point. And that's really what I think uh, Texture's talking about as far as kind of like, like all the possibilities. Like today, you know, five years later, again, with the protocol and unabashed success, you would think that most of those ideas would be developed. But I think in practice, we've seen almost none of them developed. Um, and the ones almost, that have been none. developed, have, yeah, have, have really not found any sort of meaningful commercial success outside of the sort of super early adopter community. So again, like at the time we were like, oh my God, mm. this is so modern, but it was so again, just like ahead. And it's not to say, I think that it's really easy to be like, oh, we were so ahead of the times. It's not really that. It's more just like mm -hmm. exposure to the ideas when you're someone who is looking for solutions to things that are impossible in the rest of the world. That's what drew me to Bitcoin was that it made things possible that were impossible before it. And when that's true, and we have a fundamental technology like that, it kind of requires not just thinking about what are the new ideas, but going back to all the old ideas that didn't work because that thing that is possible now wasn't possible before and ethereum was that even more ethereum was right. was that you know even more I, I i would go build on that by saying mm -hmm. the ideas that you heard being bandied about in early 2014 for the blockchain which adam and anthony just said didn't really get built those ideas were actually pretty dumb ideas and <laughs> it was to me obvious when I heard those ideas that they were dumb ideas, but that didn't matter. Like if mm. you take fire as an invention and you imagine yourself as a cave person who was the first person who's figured out how to start a fire on a repeat basis, not just get one when there's a lightning strike and you have that fire, you probably know that it's hot and can warm you. You probably know it's dangerous and might be used as a weapon. You probably know that it creates light. Those are really obvious things really quickly. And you might throw it in a pit or put it on a stick and all of a sudden, because it's new, people from town or your camp come around and sit around and the campfire gets created. 
So in the early days of fire, there were probably four or five really obvious things you could do with it. It took 1 million years for the steam engine to be invented, which allowed us to build cities that extend out into the land. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at a new technology, it's almost more important to be willing to accept that whatever you think it's gonna do is not likely to be what it does at the end of the day. And Ethereum was exactly that. The ideas people were talking about, some of them worked, um, some of them never got built, some of them never got funded for reasons that I think are pretty realistic and reasonable. Um, and I suspect that the absolute biggest ideas of the blockchain are still five or 10 years away for in, in our lifetime. So there may be stuff a million years out, but in our lifetime, we haven't begun to see the biggest ideas of the blockchain. And that was certainly true with the internet. Mm. No, I think you're, you're totally right. It, it makes a lot of sense that it was really hard to imagine, you know, what Ethereum uh, would create or, or can still um, foster. So, I mean, just curious, like what sorts, I mean, what ideas were, were people talking about back then, 2014, that, that to you can were like really bad, <laughs> bad ideas? Do you remember? Uh, yeah, there was some supply chain stuff that mm -hmm. obviously this is going to be big in the supply chain. But the people who were talking about the ideas had never bought anything overseas, didn't know what a bill of lading was or a certificate mm -hmm. of inspection was. And so when they talk about the supply chain ideas, and I couldn't point to a specific one, it was just obvious that that was not the idea. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't recall the ideas. I can't recall the good ideas, much less the bad ideas. <laughs> there were so many in that there was a, um, a competition, uh, basically an incubator for, I think, two hours at that, in that um, Texas Bitcoin conference. And the ideas were so bad. And actually, a handful <laughs> of them got funded. Um, yeah. And the best, I think the one that won was storage which was actually a super, oh, okay. interesting, was a super interesting idea. Um, mm -hmm. And I began to think also, because I think he was uh, 18 at the time and Vitalik was 19. I began to think that I was a grandparent in that industry and probably should stay away. <laughs> I mean, it, was really, it was really a young moment mm -hmm. in, in, the, in the blockchain, literally and figuratively. Um, okay, so then from, from this kind of initial moment where you all felt so inspired by, by Ethereum, um, in the years that, that followed, especially, you know, the, the very early years of, of Ethereum's history, there were obviously uh, tons of roadblocks, problems um, from, you know, mismanagement, uh, people, uh, you know, like Adam being, um, you know, have their doubts about the pre-sale, uh, the DAO, obviously, all of these things happen. So, was your how did your view of Ethereum change throughout kind of the the, the very early days of, of its history? Um, yeah, who, who who wants to to go first? I'll go. Okay. Go ahead, yeah, Go ahead. No, <laughs> I mean, you go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. All right, I'll go first. Um, <laughs> so we also got a question that can kind of tie into this from the audience that uh, what's my issue with the pre mine and have my thoughts changed. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, in the kind of uh, precursor, uh, you know, projects to Ethereum, um, many projects uh, launched with pre mines, and it was different from Bitcoin. So for people who are trying to sort of recreate the success that Bitcoin had, it seemed like that was an important thing that you didn't want to do because it casts doubt on the commitment of the founders of the project. Because to a large extent, if you have a you know, portion of a pre-mine, then your coin doesn't have to be very successful in order for you basically to have won the lottery and not need to do the project anymore because you already won. So that was my big concern was sort of concerns about the legitimacy of the project and the ability of it to succeed if it was perceived by people not to be legitimate. I think one of the reasons why it really succeeded was because before they launched the sale of the token, they did such a good job of pulling together a compelling team. And that was something that Bitcoin never had. Bitcoin never had, you know, like the Bitcoin team, right? Core developers mm -hmm. showed up and were like, hey, I'm contributing to Bitcoin. And that was pretty much it. There was no like, hey, and now you're on the team moment for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and with and Ethereum. And community too, Adam. 
right? For sure, absolutely. But but I think that it was that it was the the team that allowed the community to coalesce around it. And then the other thing that Ethereum did really really well is it talked about itself in ways that were aspirational and very relatable. And I think that that was also very different from Bitcoin, which was really again like the future of money, right? Which kind of implies that the old way of doing money has to necessarily go. And so it's a very adversarial poise that it took. Whereas Ethereum was doing something that nobody really even believed was possible in the conventional world. But if it was, then it opened up all of these possibilities. So um, I think that, you know, that's like, just from a messaging standpoint, and just from like a communicating about what was possible versus what the technology is today, Ethereum was so successful in that, that I think that is in large part what drove the success of it. And then it was able to kind of backfill that technology in uh, behind the vision, but it was very much a vision first project. Um, and I think it succeeded as a result of that in ways that other projects have not. So did your, were your concerns about the, the pre-mine and pre-sale kind of you know, east after after seeing the, its success? I mean, sure, again, like at the point that it mm -hmm. succeeds, then obviously my concerns about something preventing it from succeeding uh, kind of went away. Like I still, again, mm -hmm. like- So it's I, not about like the legitimacy of like Ethereum because of the pre-mine. It's more about like what, what you said, like will it prevent it from Right. incentives mm -hmm. it's 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 getting in the way of a beautiful idea right like if an mm -hmm. idea is doomed to failure because it's a bad idea then it doesn't matter what stupid things you do that might prevent it from succeeding because it's not going to succeed anyways but it was always obvious that the idea that was at the core of ethereum was super interesting and whether mm -hmm. it was ethereum or another project that was basically what i thought is that well ethereum is going to lose the game by trying to make it so that their founders win kind of up front just for having played it all and that might prevent people from really jumping on. But in practice, that didn't happen at all. In practice, right, they right. built a strong enough team that that's, you know, that was not yeah. the problem. And I, so, and I think, oh, sorry, but I think what Adam said about the, str like the, the strength of the team, um, you know, most of the people, including myself, were not in Ethereum to get rich. We did not right. care. And the people that did care about that were the people that ended up kind of being eaten alive and kicked out of the project. Um, if you look, if you look at the great wins in history, and by great wins, I don't mean investment. I'm talking about the building of the great businesses. They they shared something in common, in addition to having massive markets. And usually, they take some new technology and do something new with it. They have incredibly mission driven teams that are brilliant. And so you can look at lots of ideas. Pick social networking. Social networking had six degrees and had MySpace before Facebook. Facebook assembled a mission-driven world-class team. Whatever you think of the company, it was an extraordinary team that built that in the early days. The same thing with Google. There were an awful lot of search engines built into portals and the Google team was just head and shoulders ab above everyone else. So it's not even being first, it's about the team. And it was so mm -hmm. obvious from day one, whether or not this team got along, there was an extraordinary team. And we all got the vision. So even even after the Red Wedding, uh, even after people stopped communicating, like it was very strange for me in comms where I ended up, um, Stefan Twall didn't, he didn't allow us to talk to anyone else on any team or he would lose his mind. Like if he found out that you talked to Gav or if he found out that you talked to Jeff or if he found out that you talked to anyone not in comms, your your whole day was going to be getting lectured about how we couldn't talk to the enemy and i was like so, what the <laughs> so i mean to, to my initial question like did these dynamics change your perception of what ethereum could become and or or did yeah it... yeah i mean for me personally and and this happened to actually a lot of people who were mm -hmm. founders i always call myself founding member i'm not here to argue with anyone i was i, I was there on day one I don't know how much more close you can get to being a founder, but I don't care about that argument. Um, a lot of people sold their ether before the Ethereum network launched. I almost did it because it was such a clusterfuck. And I've been in, um, you know, I've been in startups for a year, failed startups for years before that. And there was no, nothing to indicate to me that it was not about to fail tragically based on the amount of chaos that was happening. So I actually almost sold all my ether to Vlad who had already sold all his ether the week before and regret it. And then the next day they announced that the network was going live the next week. And I said, never, never mind. 
it looks like we're going <laughs> to launch. So, I mean, I, I lost faith and gained faith and lost mm-hmm. faith and gained faith multiple times over. But I think the fact that everybody that was in the core team understood the vision. And I think most importantly, because there was a white paper and even the yellow paper, it allowed people to coordinate in a decentralized way without actually having to get along, without actually having to communicate. We knew mm-hmm. what we were building. We, we had a document. We just did it and we executed and we didn't, it didn't matter the chaos because we all knew what we were doing. Mm, like hey, like hey. a Ten Commandments kind of. <laughs> well, the ca- chaos mattered, right? The chaos definitely got in the way of yeah. launching and hitting deadlines and, um, and, and communicating outside. Um, Camilla, you captured a story in your book, which I always love, which makes me look stupid, but I always love it because it just said so much about what was going on, which is at one point I reached out to Gav and I said, hey, should I sell my Ethereum? Is there anything there? And it had already been live for, I think, six or seven months. And I thought it was dead. And I thought it was dead because a decentralized project has so many things that are different about it. And in my head, I was just thinking about it the way I thought about any other investment I made. Mm. You make an investment, if it's going well, founding teams tell you it's going well, they email you. Well, they couldn't do that here because everybody contributed through Bitcoin from an unknown wallet to their wallet. And you got through a smart contract tokens back. So unless you reached out to the team and said, I invested, they wouldn't even know and had no way to communicate. So no matter how well they were doing, there was no mechanism for outbound communication. You could only communicate in. And the Mm -hmm. thing that happens in companies that are dying is they just go radio silent. The founders Mm -hmm. run out of money. They're embarrassed and they don't want to say that it's going badly. They don't want help. Uh, Or they've run out of money. They've taken another job and um, they don't even realize they need to shut the company down and provide a tax loss, right? Mm -hmm. This is a group of people who weren't communicating in part because they were not talking to each other and in part because they didn't have a mail list to reach out to their fans and supporters. So if you didn't show up at an event and talk to them or, uh, or, or read some blog somewhere, which there was no way to know what existed without being a, a PhD researcher, I was <laughs> completely out of the loop. I would occasionally email in and Joe Lubin, I think, uh, answered my emails as the head of customer service at, at one point uh, because it was That's a small so crazy. Yeah. And I, I was the only one with startup experience as to as far as I'm aware in the entire project and I kept my mouth shut about traditional things because I wasn't trying to get locked into a four-year vesting period so I didn't want to I didn't want to bring that to anyone's attention and I didn't want to just start that hey we're a startup we should run like a startup. <laughs> <laughs> it's like give me my coins if it doesn't work out I don't want to be trapped here for four years. I mean, do you um, mind if I ask a question? Yeah. Uh, what were you going to say, Adam? Yeah. So, uh, so two things. One, I think that the recognition that Ethereum was a startup, I think that that's really key here because Bitcoin mm-hmm. wasn't a startup, like I said in my earlier answer. And then the other thing, uh, Textured, were you still on when Charles and, and Jonathan and all of them kind of got exited uh, rather rudely? Can you kind of talk about that? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, so... Uh, I mean, Charles is a fuckhead. So, I mean, he's just a terrible person. He's a liar. He's a sociopath. Like, uh, you know, oh, whatever. It. I'm just, you know, hi, Charles. Um, but the thing about him is that he would, when I met him, the first time I met him in Miami, I, I was like, this is, this guy's a sociopath, but maybe he's our sociopath. So it's not a big deal. But my understanding was when they were in when they were in Zug, he was just doing all kinds of things that were not only not productive for the project, but had enough. They were just games he was playing with random people, and you know, I I guess Stefan got drunk one time, and this is my understanding. It's been years since I've been told the story, but Stefan got really drunk. And he was letting Charles's uh, assistant stay with him in London, and he just started berating his assistant and being like, "You, you love Charles, whatever." Like, and then the dude was like, "No, you love Charles." And then they found out they started talking and found out all this backdoor crazy stuff Charles had been doing. And then that kind of, I, I know in the book it was presented as like business versus nonprofit or whatever, but the experience was 
Charles was just doing crazy stuff and everybody showed up to Zug and like, not to say that there wasn't the threat of that, those two parties warring and that does make for a better narrative. But my understanding from all the stories that were told to me, because I was one of the few people that everybody trusted and everyone talked to. No one, you know, I was not on any faction. And so everybody told me their stories. So I got all perspectives and it basically was like Charles was doing crazy stuff and they had to kick him out. And then people like Amir and then Mohan actually didn't get kicked out till later. He was on Joe Lubin's side and he had kind of partnered with him. And then, my, you know, his perspective that he told me was, you know, Joe kind of betrayed him in some way and then he got ousted. And then I think Mohan was one of the people who sold all his ether before being Amir sold all his, you know, to my understanding. And they kind of exited fully. Mm. So, I mean, this, yeah. is, the I mean, this is the benefit of, of, of not operating like a startup. There's no NDA at the end. So the stories are richer and more colorful. But the yeah. truth yeah. is that these are the stories of almost every startup. Startups are messy, innovation's messy. Yeah. And the more you're around it and the more you have the ear and the trust of the founders, you, the more you hear that that's, that's not an unusual story. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've been near uh, startups as well in, in my own family, like everyone is an entrepreneur. Um, now I'm an entrepreneur too, but <laughs> I mean, everyone like fights with the co-founders, right? It's like classical uh, startup story. Yeah. Um, I think the difference here was that there were so many co-founders and, you know, so many people involved and they were all coming from um, different backgrounds, different places. Um, some, most of them had really big personalities. So of course there were going to be um, clashes between all of them um, and you know you can you can read all about it in, in the infinite machine um, which is a great book great book i recommend thank it so much thank you thanks everyone um, so i think we okay so so you all had kind of these um ups and downs uh regarding ethereum um you know losing faith regaining faith uh now like you know five years later um, comparing what you thought Ethereum would be when you first, you know, read that white paper, uh, what, you know, you described um, here in the panel and looking at where, where it is today. How, how does it um, stack up? Uh, Ken, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, it's really interesting. I still have my ups and downs with Ethereum. Um, mm. Once, once I, once I really started to see the price move and it became an important investment for me, I spent a lot more time trying to understand it so I could make intelligent investment decisions. Um, and the more I understood, the more brilliant it was, the more I liked it and the more potential I thought. Um, there came a point about a year ago where there were so many competitive solutions out that were doing things that Ethereum had been promising for a while Ethereum had a has a history of missing deadlines. Um, and I began to question whether Ethereum could maintain its lead and whether or not one of these new projects would be the Google to Ethereum's AOL. Hmm. Uh, Ethereum just got a second life in, in this year. And it got a second life from DeFi because DeFi, DeFi is giving Ethereum two things. It's giving Ethereum uh, a network effect from liquidity for the DeFi market, which I think is going to um, be very valuable to buy Ethereum time to get next generation Ethereum out. And two, there is now an installed base of companies that depend on Ethereum mm -hmm. that really can't easily move. Uh, partially because they're an installed base, partially there's a network effect around that, and partially there's a network effect around liquidity. So Ethereum is not dying anytime soon. Uh, will somebody beat it? It's entirely possible if I were a betting person, yes. Will somebody go mm -hmm. ahead of Ethereum in the next two or three years? Much tougher to say no to that question today than, I, than, than two years ago. Um, so I do think Ethereum has a, a good future in, front of it in the midterm. But if I were a betting person 10 years from today, I think there would be a better technology um, that emerges that can do more things faster at lower cost. It, it, retrofitting Ethereum is going to be very hard to make it competitive. The there world. are some. There are and some if, obvious. ETH two doesn't do that. No, so I'm sorry. No, I was asking Ken whether I mean, do you think ETH two doesn't doesn't do that? Um, 
I'm not sure if it does or doesn't. So I'll give you an example. I'm not sure if sharding is the solution. It may well be. If it's not, it could be that Solana's hardware solution is really very potent. It could be that Coda's mobile phone solution is really very potent. It could be that a privacy blockchain becomes more important as government more and more involved. So I don't know what it's going to be that's going to be 10x, but anytime we see a protocol that's doing something in order of magnitude different, that leads to an order of magnitude or more improvement in performance, I'm going to write a check because the, the, the returns are so asymmetric. Right. You can only lose 100% of your money, but you can make thousands of times on your money if you get this, if you get this, this bet right. So from an investment standpoint, um, I don't know the answer to that question. Okay. Um, yeah. Maybe, I guess, is the answer. Yeah. <laughs> Adam? I mean, Ethereum was the first, you know, uh, successful cryptocurrency or protocol, perhaps a cryptocurrency protocol as a startup. So I think that there could be more successful startups. I also think that maybe there's another structure besides what Bitcoin did and besides what Ethereum did that winds up being the thing. Maybe DAOs are it, right? Like mm. that's an idea that's been around for longer than Ethereum, arguably. Uh, called DAOs now, called DAX at the time, distributed autonomous corporations from uh, the Laramers yep. uh, in the very early days. They're not mutually exclusive, Adam, are they, in your view? Well, they're, I mean, the reality of it is, is that that name changed because everybody was like, oh, if they're corporations, then they're probably that's, regulated. But organizations, yeah. That's illegal. Uh, yeah so, I we mean, would, like, the, the, and we liked uh, the play on DAO, like, like, like DAO, like the philosophical thing. Right. But the ideas funny. are fundamentally almost identical i mean like this kind of autonomous structure um you know where instead of kind of having a hierarchical system which is what typically organizations are instead you have basically a flat system where everybody kind of contributes and it's the whole idea of the um what did i say at the time uh the intelligence being at the edge of the network rather than at the center of the network um and so i think that that again like there's a lot of potential there what was the actual question cammy i'm sorry <laughs> How has Ethereum pl played out relative? Yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. So again, like I think as as a startup, it's been wildly successful. It's demonstrated the path forward, and I think that we've seen in the years since, you know, in the 2017 years and kind of all the ICO stuff. You know, like everybody wanted to be Ethereum when they grew up, and mm -hmm. many of the projects that are out there, you know, are still kind of aspiring to be that. And it's a very crowded space. But again, if you look back at like what Ethereum did, Ethereum didn't succeed by being the next Bitcoin. Ethereum succeeded right. by being something completely different. And I think mm -hmm. that that's really what we're still waiting for now. We're still in this post Ethereum, pre whatever the next thing is uh, mm -hmm. era. And, and so long as we're there, it's hard to-, now, Adam, hard to Ethereum, is, this, is Ethereum still a leader in the space? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Ethereum's without question a leader in the space, just like Bitcoin is. Like Ethereum being invented and being successful doesn't have any negative impact on Bitcoin. If anything, it further emphasizes the value of these decentralized platforms and how powerful they can be. It's just a different type of decentralized platform. I agree. Yeah. How about for and you, Texture? So for me, because again, I didn't come into Ethereum reading the white paper and then imagining the network in that way I, I imagined i imagined it what what it was that could be accomplished and in, in what ways it could be accomplished and what what types of structures needed to be implemented for it to work and so like i said i read the white paper i said this isn't quite it but it's close enough mm -hmm. um so a lot of the things that like we were discussing this in the green room like a lot of people are trying to load all the computation on the layer one that's ridiculous people still haven't realized that's ridiculous the initial DAO, they were writing code that was far too complex in a language and on a system that had not had a, hist a history of um uh finding bugs and, and and the way that you patch security holes is you have to fail find them and then you know modify the system and, and they went too large too fast mm. the the next thing is that you know, if you look at what we're trying to accomplish with this decentralized computation, the fundamental structure of both Bitcoin, Ethereum, and all Ethereum competitors is actually fundamentally wrong from, from the ground up. Um, what, and I think the mistake that Ethereum ha made is that because it was based off of Bitcoin, the base protocol layer rests in being a cryptocurrency first and a computational layer second. 
what you actually want to do is you want to coordinate the distribution of computational um, machinery, right? So you want to be able to distribute computational uh, structures in a decentralized manner. So like little microservers that do things, you want to be able to have one of those layers be cryptocurrency. Maybe you can spin up other cryptocurrencies, but you also have things like managing just basic distribution of files, right? So things like IPFS, things like uh, storage. Now what you really, I think the next uh, iteration of what blockchain should be uh, in that is not Ethereum, that is not a permutation of Ethereum, that is not an Ethereum killer or copy is reconceptualizing from the ground up that actually the something like Ethereum, something like Bitcoin, something like storage should actually be built on a base protocol which serves those things, right? Mm. So you, you kind of want to look at things like Kubernetes or those type of things and then kind of imagine a base layer almost like an, a decentralized app store with secure um, executable verifiable code that's distributed that way uh, and um, you know to me that that was always obviously what the thing should have been Ethereum is the step and when I see that next thing you know somebody executing on that which I've still seen no one even come close to even conceptualizing this that's when I see that coming that's the team that that I think I will see that has the vision for the next mm. uh, step so in what we're working towards maybe we should look out for texture chain <laughs> for that um and <laughs> i think we, we need a whole different uh panel to to talk about you know how blockchain should be like redesigned it's uh you know it, interesting for sure i think you know for now we, we need to be wrapping up but um you know i, I think it's it's clear that ethereum has succeeded uh at least to some extent in on its fifth birthday um yet to to, to be seen whether uh, how how far that uh, it, will, it will continue to grow if if it will continue to lead in the smart contracts um application space um so far it's leading but uh hope we will see what happens for the, the 10th birthday <laughs> um it was great uh catching up with all of you thank you so much Thanks, um for an interesting conversation thanks for writing the book and everything you did. Yay. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thank Bye you. The